welcome to my channel. My name is Lisa Alistway, and I create inspirational and informational videos you can use and apply to your life. My guest today is Dr. Trevor Evans, who has worked in the hair care industry for almost 30 years. He is the director of research at the Textile Research Institute, Princeton, which is an independent nonprofit scientific research and education organization. Dr. Evans possesses a PhD in the area of physical analytical chemistry and has spent his career using instrumental testing approaches to support the development, launch, and maintenance of many international cosmetic products and brands. He teaches courses in hair science, hair claims, and the hair care industry. He's published numerous articles in trade magazines and the scientific literature and is the co-author and co-editor of the book, Practical Modern Hair Science. I will be linking his website below for your reference. Welcome. Thank you, Lisa. Do you have anything else you would like to add to the bio? Um, I guess I should probably address the elephants in the room before we start. In the, in the minute, you're probably going to be asking hair advice from, from a bald guy. <laughs> um, so I, I should point out, uh, as you mentioned, I've been doing this for a long time. When I started in this industry, I, I did have a big full head of hair. Um, I grew up in the 80s. We all had big hair in the 80s. Um, and so I certainly remember what it's like for to have hair and for it to be important. And, and you know, for many, many women and men, that hair is extremely important to them. It helps define who they are. And when the hair looks good, you know, they feel good. If the hair doesn't look good, they, they feel that they're not looking their best and, and perhaps feel a bit self-conscious. And so it's it's very important to many, many people. But I think it also confuses many, many people. And uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I've worked in this industry for, for so long, and I, I feel a bit sad that people are confused by it, that there's so much misinformation out there. And so, uh, so I've made it a bit of a, a mission for me in, in later years to, to try and help, uh, you know, unmuddy the waters and give people um, perhaps clear, straight advice as to, you know, what really is the science of why these products work and what is right for them. And so I, I hope we can do some of that for your, uh, your viewers today. Awesome. And we had spoke earlier, and I know your mission is to educate and empower women and also men about the hair care industry and the hair products. So I think I would like to start off with, let's debunk some of the hair myths out there. Uh, there's a lot of them. <laughs> Where should we start? <laughs> your, your choice. Um, you know, I think if it's one thing that perhaps rubs me the wrong way, and a lot, a lot of other people who work in this industry, actually everybody who works in this industry, is that hair care products are not going to damage your hair hair care products are not bad for your hair at least conventional daily use hair care products things like shampoos conditioners hairsprays um you see an awful lot of stuff you know no poo movements don't don't wash your hair too frequently because shampooing is going to damage your hair not really i mean um in the grand scheme of things i can't say that things don't give you zero damage to hair everything you do to your hair is going to produce a little bit of damage but the the amount of damage if any which is produced by shampoos conditioners hairsprays it's just infinitesimal compared to to other things so you know i, I will hear people say i'm not going to use a shampoo with sulfates in because it's damaging to my hair and then they'll go and put a flat iron on the hair, which heats the hair to 450 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, <laughs> where do you think the damage is coming from? So, um, you know, I hear people say, well, I'm not going to use that conditioner because it has a, 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 an ingredient in there with the name alcohol in there. That would be, you know, harmful for my hair. No, it won't. There, there, is, there is nothing in a conventional shampoo, conditioner or hairspray which is going to be meaningfully damaging to your hair. Um, mm -hmm. hair ingredients being called out all the time and it's just, it's just not true. I have a question about that on um, the hair products, you know, you have the high end, very expensive salon price shampoo conditioners, and then you have like the 99 cent shampoo hair conditioners in the, you know, the grocery store, the dollar store. Um, is there a big difference between those as far as like ingredients and value and so on? Not really. I mean, if you look at the label ingredient statements, you'll, you'll find, I mean, it's, legally, you have to put a label ingredient statement at the back of all the products. And if you look at most shampoos, most conditioners, you'll find they've got pretty much the same ingredients in there, at least at the high end of the label ingredient statement. So in theory, you're supposed to label everything in the order that they're in there amount wise. Um, and so all the things at the top, you, you will see are pretty much the same things on a cheap brand versus an expensive brand. Um, really, what differentiates an expensive brand from a cheap brand? the vast majority of the time is probably fragrance and packaging. 
So fragrance yeah. packaging is what you're paying for. And so, of course, advertising. Yeah. And because fragrance is important to a lot of people. I mean, many, many yeah. people use the product that they use because they like the fragrance. And so, so long as you recognize that you are paying for the fragrance, then, then you know, please keep going if that's what you want to do. But uh, please don't be thinking that because this is a $30 bottle of shampoo, it's that much better than $5 bottle of shampoo. It, it's, it's just not going to be the case. Um, that's good news. All, all shampoos work pretty much the same way. All conditioners work pretty much the same way. So, uh, so yeah. That's a great myth to debunk. So if you're on a budget, keep this in mind. You don't have to buy the real expensive stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, what other uh, myths are out there? Um, I think, you know, to the same extent, perhaps the myth that products work differently on different hair types. So, you know, you often hear, well, this product is for African hair, this version is for Caucasian hair, this product is for blonde yeah. hair, this product is for brown hair. Um, it, it, if you look again at the science of how these products work, the, the, the science into how a shampoo works is the same science that basically goes into how your dish detergent works. It's the same science as how, what's, what, what, when you drive through a car wash. Um, the ingredients might be slightly different, but the science is the same. And so, you know, shampoo doesn't know that it's cleaning blonde hair or brown hair or black hair or blonde hair. Um, it, it just cleans. That's what it's there to do. What about thick hair versus curly hair versus straight hair? You know, the shampoo doesn't know. It just does its thing. It, it, it cleans no matter what it is. It doesn't have to be hair. It can be the dishes in your sink, you know? So the, the science is the same. So, um, but what can happen is that different people's hair perhaps needs slightly different strengths of products. So perhaps for a conditioner, again, all conditioners work pretty much the same way. They, they deposit materials onto the surface of the hair. And, um, some people want a lot of conditioning because they have you know, long, thick, curly hair that, that is quite difficult to detangle and perhaps starts to feel a bit rough. Um, you, put, you give that same product to somebody who has fine, thin hair and it's going to be too much. It's going to weigh the hair down. So it, it's not like somebody with thick, curly hair needs a completely different product from somebody with fine, thin hair. It's essentially the same product, but just with different strengths of ingredients. And so- What about um, bleached hair? So bleached hair, again, we were talking about a little bit of damage earlier on, things that can damage hair. Once we get into the chem chemical treatments, they can be really quite damaging to the hair. And I think most people recognize this, but the ends justify the means, so to speak. So, you know, if somebody really wants to straighten the hair, they're gonna say, okay, putting 450 degree flat iron on my hair it is worth it. I know it's gonna be damaging. Uh, people will say changing the color of my hair. Okay, I know it's going to be damaging, but yeah, it's sort of worth it. And so, um, so again, what, what really what conditioners and things do is, is that they mask um, those damaging effects. So they don't they don't physically repair your hair. So I guess that was going to be one of my myths as well that you can yeah, physically. That's on you know, a lot of the conditioning <laughs> bottles. A lot yes, of the little yes. repair. Yeah, and you know, again, what we're talking about here is soap and water. Soap and water doesn't really repair anything, right? But uh, what soap and water can do is help mask the symptoms. And so, by I mean, what a conditioner really is is it's it's a lubricant. It's it's an aesthetically pleasing lubricant. Nobody would use it if it wasn't aesthetically pleasing. But but basically, it, it's as the surface of your hair starts to degrade and starts to feel rough and coarse. Uh, you put this nice lubricant on the surface of the hair and it sort of mitigates that. So people don't feel it being rough and coarse anymore. And they say, oh, my hair used to feel crappy. Now it doesn't. It must have been repaired. And really what it, what it is. So, so that the word repair appears on um, products in large parts, well, totally, basically, because that's the consumer perception rather than it being what technically happens. But, uh, you know, that's, a, that's another myth you often see. You see those high magnification pictures of the surface of the hair sometimes. Um, you know, the surface of the hair sort of looks like the tiles on the roof of a house, these overlapping platelets. And, and those, those platelets will degrade over time. You know, just, just like the elements pound on the roof of your house and, and those tiles start to chip and crack and uplift, the same happens to those tiles that's got on, on, on the surface of your hair. And uh, you can't repair that. But what happens is that the, the conditioner puts that lubricating layer over the surface. And so you don't feel it anymore and it helps mitigate against that. And so, uh, 
Um, and it's you know, temporary, obviously. It, it's temporary. You know, the only way you can really fix it is to, to cut it off and start again. But, uh, you know, I think most people recognize that you can't really truly mend split ends and things like that. But, but you can mask them for a little bit. But ultimately, what you really have to do is, is cut them off and start again. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, and what's another uh, myth that's out there? Um, you know, I think lots, lots of sort of trends crop up. And one of the big sort of trends that's going on right now is this whole natural movement. So, um, you know, everybody wants everything to be natural. Um, the trouble is nobody really can define what natural is. So, you know, what, what makes something natural versus unnatural? And, um, yeah, and also the whole, the whole idea that just because something isn't natural, uh, makes it bad. Um, you know, many of those ingredients that you see in the hair care products, they have those big, long, chemical sounding names. And yeah. People, people don't like those big, long names. This, they can be afraid of them. But yeah. actually, those are the ingredients that provide all the efficacy. Um, there might be some nice, you know, extracts and things listed that, that, that sound kind of cool, but they're not really the things that have the efficacy. It's those, it's those chemical sounding compounds that, that are really what's giving you the efficacy. Um, and so, so everybody wants everything to be natural these days, but uh, yeah. you know, your, your shampoo is, is you know, 90% water. <laughs> so, so you could argue water is natural, right. but shampoo is mainly natural. Right. And these are the sort of games that people play to try and make right. it to, to position their product in a vein that, you know, has, oops, no worries. <laughs> well, my apologies, that, that has an attractive proposition to it and uh, <laughs> people would want to buy, but uh, nobody can tell you what, there is no definition to what is natural and what is natural. And uh, again, even those, even those nice natural sounding ingredients obviously are still made of chemicals. <laughs> so you, we all sort of chuckle when we see chemical free. Um, yeah. There's no such thing as chemical free. We're all made of chemicals for goodness sake. So, uh, so you know, these incredible. are, these are the things um, marketers, consumer scientists, um, yeah. market researchers, they, they talk to individuals and hear how people talk about their hair. And then the idea is the manufacturers want to you know, use that same language to count, try and recount um, the benefits of the products. And so they are hearing all of this naturals and so forth. And, and so they're telling the product developers, we need to make everything natural. And the product developers are saying, well, what does natural mean? <laughs> and nobody knows. Right. So, uh, right. so it's almost like the consumers are demanding something that they don't quite even understand. <laughs> yes. Um, and then, you know, it, it, we live in a sort of bizarre world where very often there is more advertising telling you what's not in there versus what is in there. You know, sulfate free, silicone free, preservative free. Yeah. Um, so it, it is bizarre. And uh, again, there is the perception out there that, that these things are, are, are you know, detrimental to the properties of your hair when they really, really aren't. Um, and again, it's those chemical sounding materials that, that are giving you all of the efficacy. You, you take those out and your shampoo's not going to work anymore. Um, you know, you take the silicones out and, and your product's not going to feel like it used to be. Um, silicones feel wonderful. That's why they're in so many products. Yeah, there might what be an argument. Um, again, it, it's, it's a very nice, aesthetically pleasing oil. So it, it will make your hair feel wonderful. It will make your skin, uh, skin lotion feel nice and smooth and silky on the skin. It makes your antiperspirant stick feel nice and smooth and silky. So they just have a wonderful feel factor. Mm. But, uh, and, and part of the argument is is how well these materials are broken down you know in the environment I and mean, are they safe for the environment and that, that's not really my field i can't talk too much in that area but um but somehow it gets extrapolated into that they're harmful for your hair and actually you know quite frankly these, these are the things that's giving you the great feel and so if you strip these out the products just aren't going to feel as good as they used to so exactly. it is funny that consumers often ask to take out things that really are the things that are giving you all the benefits but because yeah. you know of, of a degree of chemophobia i suppose i've heard that uh this could be a hair myth you can correct me if i'm wrong you know about brushing your hair i've heard two things that you know you should you should brush it so that the oil can get distributed really nice and it's good to brush your hair brush your hair a lot every day and then i've heard the opposite as well like don't brush your hair too much because it causes breakage so which one is it <laughs> Um, it, 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 you know, and honestly, perhaps, this is perhaps another myth. There's not one thing that's right for all hair, right? There's, there's not one product that's right for all hair. It sort of depends on your habits and practices and so forth. And so, 
Um, you know, what brushing does is it aligns your hair, basically, right? So without that, the hair is going to be misaligned. And, and aligned hair has a lot of benefits. Aligned hair looks shinier. Aligned hair will, will move more naturally. Um, you know, that grooming process will, will perhaps pull out some of the dead fibers that are, that are you know, starting to misalign with the hair. Um, and of course, you know, it allows you to create the style that you want. So, so people are not going to brush anymore. Um, there was always the old housewife's tale that you should brush your hair a hundred times a day was something I remember hearing when I first started in this industry. But, you know, brushing does, it adds friction. So fibers rub against each other, the brush rubs against it. So again, remembering that every hair fiber has that, you know, like the tiles on the roof of the house structure, um, mm -hmm. that structure can be beaten up mm -hmm. by all the friction and the abrasion that goes into the, the, the grooming process. But again, a, a good reason to use a good conditioner. The conditioner is a lubricant. So when you are brushing your hair, it, it's cutting down on the amount of friction and abrasion. And um, it, you, you see a lot of products claim that they protect the hair. And you know, that, that's, that's a legitimate claim. If, if you have these lubricants on the surface, you're not going to produce as wear, much wear and tear as you would without them. So, uh, so I always tell people use, you know, use as much conditioner as your hair can actually tolerate. Um, you might use too much and it weights it down, but uh, you know, experiment and try and figure out what's, what's the maximum amount of conditioning your hair can take. And that's probably what you need to be using. Speaking of conditioner, the difference between like the conditioner you use in the shower and then the leave-in conditioner, what are your thoughts on that? Um, again, if you look at that label and green statement, you, you'll see that they're pretty much the same thing. Um, often a leave-in conditioner, Perhaps it is thickened up a little bit, um, or, or maybe it becomes a spray. Um, but the, formula wise, they're, they're pretty much the same thing. So you, you could you could use your your regular uh, rinse off conditioner as a leave in if you wanted to. And you know, as I mentioned before, what, what what this is really doing is it's depositing materials on the surface of the hair, which is going to um, alleviate some of the negative feel and improve the manageability. And how much stuff deposits depends on how you use it. Right. So if you put a little on your hair and leave it in for a short period of time, you're not going to leave as much as you would if you put a lot on your hair and left it in for longer before you rinse it. And of course, if you leave it in completely, then none of it rinses out. So, so it's all about depositing this material on the surface of your hair, which, which has lots of benefits to it. But uh, you know, perhaps at the same time, you can go too far and put more down. And so... Uh, yeah. You know, perhaps another nice tip is if, if you are if you're using a conditioner and you feel like the conditioner isn't conditioning enough for your hair, use more. Leave it on right. long before you rinse it. That that will leave more stuff behind. So uh, so it's not just the product that dictates you know how how your hair is going to behave. It's the way the product is used. That probably every bit as much as the product itself. Yes, I always heard don't put a lot of conditioner on the um, like your scalp because it'll like weigh your hair down. Yes. So, you know, again, your hair grows at about half an inch a month. So, you know, looking at the length of your hair, the tips of your hair, they're probably a year and a half, to two years old. So they have had two years worth of wear and tear associated with grooming and, and all the other things that you do to your hair. And so, so the tips are more damaged than the root. And so the, the root is where the, you know, the freshly grown hair comes out. It's really not very damaged. So, you know, the, the more your hair has been beaten up, <laughs> the more conditioning yeah. it needs, basically. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So um, before we move on, any other tips or any other myths? I should um, say. I'm sure more will come to me as we talk, okay. but perhaps those, uh, but, but uh, again, it's just this week I was reading um, one of the big you know, ingredients, one of the big suppliers has had a, a class action lawsuit um, on one of their brands um, because people believed it was making the hair fall out and was irritating the scalp. And uh, they were blaming the preservative. And um, it's actually piggybacking, I guess, on, on another big company got, got challenged for the same thing. Um, again, blaming the preservative and saying the preservative made my, my hair fall out. But uh, you know, this, this is a preservative that's been used in the industry for decades. There's never been anybody considered issues before. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, again, it, it, it's, it's people, people pick up these perceptions and in this new world we live in of blogging and, and uh, you know, so forth. And this stuff can spread like nobody's business. And, and so it is, it is sort of weird to see how many of these, I, I guess I call it 
cosmetic ambulance chasing uh, sort of things that go on, you know, where people will say or, or perhaps believe that they have had a reaction due to um, somebody doing something inappropriate with the formulation. And uh, yeah. um, it, it, it's really just not true. But these ideas proliferate our industry like nobody's business. Um, yeah. You know, you know what, what a preservative does is it stops bugs from growing in your shampoo. Um, stops mold and bacteria growing in your shampoo if it's if it's one thing i want my shampoo free of it's bugs so please yeah. please put as much preservatives in as you need uh, to stop bugs growing in my shampoo yes. so let's talk a little bit about um hair loss and some of the myths around that because i know obviously uh, men lose hair more than women but women lose it for a variety of reasons and um stress being a main one why they might be experiencing hair loss and they might be able to just, you know, grow it back. But um, I know there's some products and stuff on the market that like claim to uh, grow hair. What are your thoughts on that? Um, so your whole your, your hair growth is really dictated by the physiology of your body. And there's a sort of defining boundary between what is called a cosmetic and what would be called a drug, which involves whether it affects your body's physiology. So what we're doing in cosmetics is usually we're putting layers on the surface and so forth, whether it be your skin, whether it be your hair. They're not really things that are changing your body's physiology. Something that changes your body's physiology slides into the realm of a drug. So if we're talking about true hair growth, so something like, um, you know, Rogaine or so forth, which, which is out there, that's regulated as a drug. Um, Rogaine is known to be able to grow hair to a certain extent. Doesn't work for everybody. Doesn't, you know, will never change no hair to really big thick hair, but it can convert fine hair into, into thicker hair and so forth. But it is regulated it as a- More hair, the Rogaine doesn't create. Is Rogaine topical or uh, oral? It's, oral it's, it's, it's topical, yeah, yeah. It is a topical, yeah. okay. So it, it can help, it can grow hair in some people. It doesn't work for everybody. You know, again, this, this is pretty well documented out there and it will never turn, you know, no hair like I have into, into big thick hair. But what it can do is people with thinning hair, it can make some of those thinner hair fibers somewhat thicker and, and start to make the hair a bit better than what it was. And that's it's right. based on the person's individual chemistry because you said it's different well, it, for Yes, I mean, it, it's, um, it, it doesn't work for everybody, like I say, and it is a drug. It is affecting your body's physiology. So, um, and because of that, it's regulated by the FDA. And so yes. any formulation changes that, that Johnson & Johnson needs to make, who owns Rogaine, uh, again, have to be approved by, by the FDA. And, and that becomes monstrously expensive to do any kinds of testing. So if you want to play in the real, the drug area of making hair grow, it's a very, very expensive area because you have to push everything through the FDA. Right. If it's a cosmetic, then by its definition, it can't really make your hair grow more. Mm -hmm. So if you have, if you see a shampoo or a conditioner, uh, which says it will help you grow more hair or help you grow your hair faster, um, then I'm afraid that just isn't happening. Um, yeah. It, yeah, it, it, it's, the only thing that's going to really give you hair is a hair transplant if you want something that's going to work 100%. Yes, and, and you know, they, they have grown a, a lot better than they used to be. I, I remember um, you know, when I was young, you used to see people who had hair transplants and they looked horribly unnatural. But, yes. uh, but now um, you know, people seem to have got that pretty good. And uh, we, we organized the conference a, a couple of years ago. We had a hair transplant surgeon come and show us uh, the, the science behind how that works. And uh, it was fascinating. It was, it's a bit grisly to see but uh, it was still and, fascinating it's, and, and yeah. there's more women getting it it's not just something we associate with men because balding seems to occur more in men but there's a lot of women that are dealing with balding especially with the aging process and are considering hair transplants is probably the only viable option yes it probably is you know for, for, for guys you know the bald look uh, it, it isn't out of the question you know guys can get away with it but but, but it's not really really work for a woman so uh, you know when i hear stories about women losing their hair those are the ones that really make you hurt for a guy heck no big deal shave your head but uh, yes. um but for women then uh, yeah it, it really is is very sad to hear stories of people who are losing it and uh, and again people are getting sucked in to buy expensive shampoos exactly. and conditioners uh, you know, which well, this won't block your pores, and it's like, no, come on, that's that's just nonsense. Yeah. That's why it's so important to be informed and educated on this because there are a lot of um, 
unscrupulous marketing and branding and advertising that, you know, desperate women who want their hair are looking for. And so you have to really educate yourself on this. Yes. Uh, and, you know, be skeptical as well. Um, you know, it, it's, um, you know, I, I sometimes wonder, you know, the, the, this product contains nettle extract. Well, what made you think nettle extract would be good for your hair? You know, it yeah. might be good for the nettle, but what makes you think it's good for your hair? It's worth thinking through, well, does that, does that story they're telling here really make sense? And, um, Again, you know, a lot, of, a lot of these extracts that the people tend to uh, spin the stories around are, are really there just to differentiate products. Um, they're not yeah. really, they're not really in there at any sort of functional levels. It's, it's all those chemical sounding ingredients that are the functional ones. Yeah, those other ones make it sound perhaps a bit more attractive. But uh, you know, one, one of the sort of sad ironies of our industry is that probably the more prominent you see an ingredient, um, you know, emblazoned all over the packaging or over the advertising probably the higher likelihood it doesn't actually do anything. Um, so uh, it, it's there to, to help produce some brand differentiation and perhaps make it sound a bit more natural and attractive when, um, uh, you know, let's say, th 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 those in, in their microscopic levels. Yeah. Um, what about hair color? So, you know, for example, you have the over-the-counter hair color boxes, and then you can go to the salon and get your hair done. And that hair color is not sold to the regular population. Like we don't have access to it. So is it any better? Why don't we have access to, access to it as the general population? Um, I, I think the main, <laughs> what they are is they're a bit more powerful. And so because they're a bit more powerful in the wrong hands, they have the potential to be a bit more dangerous. So, you know, you, you hear stories of people who, who try to dye their own hair and something went horribly wrong and they ended up frying the hair. Again, most of that, it, that that's a rarity. Um, but if hair is especially damaged, then damaged hair is much more susceptible to additional damage. So if your hair is already quite damaged and you put something more damaging onto your hair, it, it can start having a bit of a runaway effect. So the, the, the brands that are sold for the stylists, they're usually a bit stronger, and so they can give you somewhat of a better performance, but they're probably best performed by a professional who will note all this stuff. If you used it at home, there's, there's the potential that you could over-process your hair more with these stronger products. So, um, so it's essentially the same science, it's essentially the same chemistry, but I think taken out of the consumer's hands, just because there is the possibility of it lead into negative, stronger negative effects because of the stronger efficacy of the product. Oh, so probably won't ever have access to it. Um, no, probably not. Um, but again, the, the, the regular stuff will work fine as well. Um, uh -huh. I, say it's, I think people recognize that these treatments do produce some damage to the hair. So they are okay. chemical treatments. They do interfere with the bonds within the protein of the hair. And so the hair does become a bit weaker. It does, you know, the surface um, tiles become a bit more disrupted. So, so the hair is negatively affected, but like I say, for a lot of women, it, the, the, the pluses outweigh the minuses. <laughs> I used to have gray hair. Now I have natural looking hair or I, I want to be a blonde. And so I, I'm, uh, you know, I, yeah. I want to put up with the extra damage. And like I say, conditioners can mask all levels of damage. So you can, you can do some pretty aggressive things to your hair and it can be masked pretty well with good conditioner. Yes. So let's talk about, I heard that hair changes every seven years or something like that, especially with the aging process, the quality of your hair. Like I know that my hair in my twenties is different than my hair in my forties. Um, I do highlight, I put blonde highlights in there and it seems like it's not as healthy as it used to be. One trick that I've done is to add more dimension to make it look thicker. So I have like the low lights with the highlights so that it looks thicker. But um, what is the process with the aging process? What's going on with our hair? You know, that's, that's an interesting one. And I'm not gonna say it's a myth as such, but I'm not sure anybody can, can, can put too much detail onto saying your, your hair is structurally different, uh, you know, as you get older than it was when you were younger. You ask anybody, what, what's the ideal state of hair? And most people say, oh, I'd like my hair to be like my daughter's hair. You know, my young daughter's hair is so yeah. soft and so smooth. Um, why can't I have that? Now I'm in you know, more advanced years. And we don't really know the answer to that. We, we, don't, we don't even know if that's actually strictly true or, or whether there are some perception things. One of the things we know changes with age 
is um, your rate of what's called sebum production. So sebum are the natural oils. Um, you know, if you don't wash your hair for a few days and you start to feel a bit oily, that's a material that we call sebum, um, which is constantly being excreted, you know, out onto the scalp and onto your hair. And I think in large part, people think it, it's sort of nature's natural conditioner that's, that was always there to, you know, pr provide some effects to the surface of the hair. As we get older, our, our sebum production falls off. And so our hair is, is not necessarily being coated with as much of these natural oils that, that are coming out of your scalp as, as it once was. Does that affect the properties of your hair? Not really sure, but we know that your sebum production does change. The one thing that definitely happens to your hair with aging is you have less fibers on your head. So, you know, whether you go, you, you lose everything, but everybody loses some fibers with age. And how many fi how, the density of hair on your head is also going to give you a, a lot of the perception of how your hair feels. And so if you put a gun to my head and said, why do people hair feel different as they get older? I would lean towards the fact that you probably have less hair than you once did. Um, maybe not to the point that you're noticing I have less hair, but it's probably not yeah. quite as dense as it used to. There's some evidence to suggest that your hair gets thinner with age. It's not hugely convincing, but there, there seems to be possibly a tendency there, but again, nothing monstrously dramatic. And so uh, it is a bit of a mystery. The, the same thing's true with gray hair. You know, everybody thinks gray Someone hair. <laughs> everybody thinks, you know, that gray hair fiber that sticks out from the rest of them, um, you know, looks and feels and, and acts much more differently. But uh, yeah. if, if you actually, you know, I, 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 I've published papers where we were looking at gray hair fibers that came from an individual versus natural ones. And we couldn't find any differences in, in the properties of the hair that we could measure that, that, that put differences between the two. So um, you know, there's still, still a lot of things we don't know about hair, even after all these years of doing research on it. I heard that gray hair is not gray. It's actually white or transparent. Yeah, that, that's true. So um, what, what creates the natural color of your hair is, is what's called menolin. Um, so these, if you look in very high magnification, you can see these little granules of menolin within your hair, and that's what gives your hair its natural color. Uh, and this is inside of the hair. And so um, the higher the density of those, the, the, the more dark your color uh, of your hair is. And there's actually two different types of menolin. Um, there's something called eumenolin and one called pheomenolin. And it's the pheomenolin which has the reddish coloration. So that's, that's what leads to people who have you know, red or ginger hair. Yeah. Um, but your body can decide every now and then that it just doesn't want to produce any more melanin anymore. And that's what really leads to the gray hair. So it's not actually colored gray. It's completely devoid of any color whatsoever. And um, so really uh, what they are are white. But I think perhaps the contrast um, within the natural color is what can make them look a bit gray rather than being pure white. So is genetics related to your hair and how your hair kind of is, whether it goes gray, the way that the texture is and so on? Um, it, it would seem to be, um, you know, you hear about, well, baldness runs in the family and things like that, and perhaps, you know, premature graying runs in the family. But in all honesty, you know, again, it's all down to your body's physiology and your body's physiology is so complicated that in all honesty, we don't know. Um, you know, you do hear stories of, of uh, perhaps women go through menopause and they think the hair really changes in, in its properties then. And the physiology of your body is changing. And so it's, it's very possible that uh, it, it's affecting your hair growth in some way. Um, you know, another story here is, is people go through chemotherapy and they will say that my hair completely changed properties. Yes. Um, I, I had an old, old boss who, you know, this, this is a while ago, she used to perm her hair and she, she ended up having to have chemotherapy and the hair grew back curly. She never needed to perm oh. her hair again. So, um, you know, it, it's a very complex process and uh, in honesty, we don't know it, but uh, we don't know the answers to it right now. But, uh, you know, again, this is all your body's physiology and, and outside of the realm of anything your hair care products are going to do because they are cosmetics. Yeah. There's a whole movement of embracing your gray hair, whereas previous generations would go into their 80s, 90s, just fighting it all the way till, you know, the casket. And so um, now we're seeing younger women 30s, 40s, 50s, they're embracing the gray hair and they are happy with it because it tends to be healthier than maybe like a bleached hair. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, same thing with boldness, I would suggest, you know, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, you know, a lot of guys embrace the boldness and uh, it, they just don't have it as a problem. Anymore. And that's, you know, I, I've worked in this industry for 35 years now. And that's one of the things I think has been most interesting is that how, how some of the, I guess, the, you know, the habits and practices have changed over the years and some of the yeah. thought processes have changed. Um, you know, you mentioned aging hair. Um, I, I worked for a company where we, we produced products probably 20 years ago that were targeted towards a, aging hair. Uh, mm -hmm. And when we tried to do a marketing test to see if people would buy this, they absolutely flopped because nobody wanted to be reminded that they were getting old when they were buying the hair care products. Um, so, but, you know, down the clock forward about 10 years and all of a sudden products started appearing on the market and they were successful. And, and so I think yes. people's mindsets change. You know, we, we never heard about naturals um, yep. 10, 15 years ago. We never heard about mildness 10, 15 years ago. Yep. Uh, again, it, the I think it's fascinating. I know a lady, she's 50. She's embraced her gray hair. It's gorgeous. Her mother's 80, still colors. <laughs> yep, yep. And it's, it's an interesting dichotomy to see the two of them and it's different generations and different way that they grew up and how they just saw how, you know, your gray hair was embraced or not embraced. I guess it's fashions, right? I mean, the same thing with yeah. curly hair versus straight hair. Um, you know, straight hair until fairly recently was in vogue for really quite a long time. And so people yeah. were using relaxers and heat straightening. And so, um, you know, from our point of view, everybody was calling us up and saying, hey, we, we want to talk about heat protection. How do we talk about heat protection? Um, you know, people, people would use formaldehyde relaxer treatments, you know, the Brazilian keratin treatments that uh, make the hair very, very straight, but use formaldehyde. And so th these, these were the hot things a few years ago because everybody wanted very straight hair. But, uh, you know, I, I think back to the 80s and, and the 70s and everybody had very curly hair. So, uh, um, so I, I guess just trends and fashions come around and go away again. So... Uh, Definitely, definitely. So what about supplements? Because um, I've seen, you know, the supplements that we take, and then you also see on the, you know, the shampoo bottle that it has vitamin E and it has vitamin whatever. Um, what are your thoughts on those? Um, <laughs> so uh, I guess uh, probably, perhaps, uh, I'm not sure if it's quite a myth, but, but uh, a, a good story to tell is that hair is dead, you know. Um, Yep. When the hair is growing deep inside the hair follicle, it is biologically active. But once it extrudes out onto your scalp, it is biologically inert. There is no more biological activity taking place. So your hair doesn't need to be nourished. Um, it doesn't need vitamins. It doesn't need <laughs> proteins. It, it's, it's, it's dead. It, it's like, you know, like my desk here. It, it's biologically yeah. inert. Um, and so a lot of these things sound attractive and again, go into marketing messages, but um, they don't really physically do anything to what is now a biologically inert substrate. Now, at the same time, can those things affect your body's physiology and make you grow more hair or better hair? I would say that the jury is still out on that. There are certainly people making some pretty aggressive claims in that area. Um, yeah, but I especially have, biotin. I've heard like some people take in two thousand milligrams of biotin every day, you yeah. know, for hair and so on. Yeah, I've seen some vitamin supplements, which again they have to have a label ingredient statement so you can see what's in there. And if you look at these these hair vitamin supplements and just compare them to a regular one, the ingredients are pretty much the same. So uh, you know, again, is it just a marketing proposition, or, or really do, does it do something? I would lean towards the second one, but uh, I don't have definitive evidence for that. But um, there, there are some very aggressive claims out there in some of these uh, vitamin supplements for hair. So, you know, make your hair stronger, make your hair shinier. Um, and I think people are going to, I actually know that, there's, that the FDA seems to be um, spending some time looking at some of these because some of them really, some of the claims on vitamin supplements can get really quite, quite outrageous. Yes, and, and you know, supplements are, um, viewed on the marketplace differently than say your medicines and they're regulated differently. So that's why they can get on the counter um, when maybe they aren't really substantiated as far as like the claims that they're making. Yeah, so I think there's, you know, a general question as to just how effective it, supplements, vitamin supplements are for anything, whether you know, your body does retain it above and beyond um, if, if you're having a healthy diet. But um, I, I think it's... Uh, I have to say, Yes, I, I, yes, I, I, but I've seen some very aggressive claims and positionings from hair care point of view, which um, I would struggle to say that there's any, anything to, to prove that that's true.
very, very interesting. So let's talk a little bit about the advertising and how they get away with putting the claims that they put on their cosmetic products and so forth. Yes, I mean, uh, shampoos are very, very, very effective at cleaning your hair. And you want to clean your hair every now and then. So, you know, we talked about this natural oil that will build up on your hair, which might be nature's natural conditioner, but give, le left to run away, it will, you know, leave your hair all oily and run down. So you want to be able to remove that. You want to be able to remove the, the conditioners that you put on the hair and, and the styling products that you put on the hair. So, so you need to give it a really good clean every now and then. Um, and um, oh, sorry, my, my mind just drifted. <laughs> I forgot your question. Go, go back. <laughs> just about the uh, the advertisements and oh, the yes. yeah yeah. So basically, what a shampoo does is it cleans your hair. Um, as those oils and greases and dirt build up on your hair, it it um, makes the hair duller. So clean, healthy hair is the shinier state. So the ability to remove those um, essentially constitutes making your hair shinier again. Um, your hair can get weighed down by all of those deposits. And so if you clean it off, people will say my hair feels more voluminous. Um, so the vast majority of all claims you see on a bottle of shampoo is because it cleans your hair. Um, it's not really marketing news to say this shampoo cleans your hair. And so what the right. marketing people tend to do is, is push to the end benefits. Um, yeah. Similar thing for conditioners. As I said, what conditioners do is, is from a technical point of view, they lubricate the hair in a nice, pleasant, aesthetically pleasing manner. But that's not a consumer word. So um, the story becomes it moisturizes the hair. It makes the hair smoother. It makes the hair softer. It makes the hair more manageable. Um, even makes the hair stronger. Um, you know, a conditioner does not physically make the individual strands of hair any stronger than they used to be. But every time you brush your hair, you are subjecting the hair to friction, abrasion, fatiguing. And that can cause hair fibers to break. So if you've right. got that lubricating layer on the hair, you don't get as much breakage. And so the consumers say, my hair is stronger. So basically, just about every claim you see on a, on a conditioner is down to the fact that it lubricates the hair. And just about every claim you see on a shampoo is down to the fact that it cleans the hair. And they do it very, very good. I'm not saying that um, you know, these products are deficient in any way. Um, yeah. But it's not really news to say it cleans the hair or lubricates the hair. And so the marketing people think of clever stories to tell that make it more um, appealing to the, the end consumer, so to speak. Yeah, like they call them half truths in uh, advertising where they sell you a little bit that's true, but then the other part, maybe not so true. Yeah, I would say sometimes they, they can perhaps be extrapolations of the truth. Um, so, you know, I get the, one, one of the good examples is moisturizing. So you know, people really believe that the hair dries out with time and it doesn't. Um, the water contents of your hair doesn't change at all. Um, but when that happens, consumers say the conditioners alleviate that factor. And again, a conditioner doesn't do anything to change the technical water content of your hair. What it does is it puts down that nice lubricating layer on the surface. So the hair no longer feels rough and coarse. So the consumer says it doesn't feel um, dry anymore. And therefore in a consumer's mind, it's been moisturized. So, you know, again, it, it relates to the consumer's perception of what happens rather than what is actually scientifically taking place. And so, that is the communication that's given to the consumer. And so, you know, is that extending the truth? It doesn't truly increase the water content of hair, but it does produce what consumers call moisturization. And so um, is it a stretch of the truth or is it, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's not completely black and white. So, um, you know, these products are very, very efficacious. They're very, very good, um, but they all do about the same thing. And so marketers need to try and come up with clever new ways to try and, try and sound unattractive exactly. to you, I'd say. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about uh, healthy hair tips. What tips would you give to somebody to keep their hair healthy? Um, I, I think the best thing I can say is really use as much, as I said before, use as much conditioning as your hair can possibly take, I would say. So it, you know, the conditioner helps mask the damage that can build up on your hair so you, you don't feel it and, and you don't see it. You can, you know, you run a brush or a comb through your hair without feeling many snags and tangles. Uh, it can alleviate those negative feel on the surface of the hair as well. Uh, but again, if you have too much, it will weigh your hair down. So, but as we said before, it also protects your hair. It, it means that you're not producing as much wear and tear when you're going through the various grooming practices and so forth. So, um, you know, you, you can't, I, 
I guess back to the very first point, you, you can't damage your hair by shampooing. You can't damage your hair by using a conditioner. Um, use them as much or as little as, as you know you think you want for what makes your your hair feel and look how you want it to. And, and again, remember that um, how you use the product has an effect yeah. as well. But uh, you know, please don't get sold on any of those ideas that um, this product nourishes the hair. Uh, or repairs the damage, um, you know, physically that can't happen. So. What about the um, hair sunscreen? Have you seen um, those products? Yes. Um, so, you know, we talked a little bit before about um, trends. I, I tend to think that perhaps sunscreens for hair is going to be something that has to come sometime down the line. Um, yeah. you know, we're told so much about how the sun is damaging for our skin. And the sun is also damaging to your hair as well. It, it's not the health issue that it is if, it, if it's damaging your skin, but uh, it most definitely can, can break down the structure of your hair. And so sunscreens for the hair, the trouble is, is the efficacy of a sunscreen depends on how much you put there, right? So if, if, you, put a, if you lather on um, your suntan lotion, it's gonna do a much better job than if you put it down there um, on, on a sparse level. If you put too much of these oily sunscreens on the surface of your hair, it's going to make the hair feel oily and weighed down and so forth. So yeah. um, unquestionably, there's a benefit to putting these ingredients on the surface of your hair. The downside is that they are oily materials and they're probably not going to make your hair feel so great if you put them there at a level where they can really be efficacious. So, um, so I think... It's, those, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, sorry, go ahead. Um, those pillows, those satin pillows for your hair to reduce breakage. Have you seen those? Pillows for your hair? No. I no pillowcase. Pillow um, no, I haven't seen those. But, but, you know, again, it sort of goes back to anything that rubs on your surface of the hair has the potential to rough up that outer tile-like structure. So I guess in theory... Uh, more often than not, I think we think about the brushing and the grooming process there, but I suppose it could, in theory, be caused as well by your pillow. Um, yeah. But uh, again, to, to say that a pillow made out of one material versus another material is more advantageous, I struggle to see how you would ever generate data to be able to say that. So uh, yeah. I don't want to write it off as being something that couldn't happen, but uh, uh, it sounds like a bit of a gimmick, <laughs> at least on the surface. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I know, obviously, don't use uh, heating tools like every day. That's probably not a good idea. I curled my hair today because we're doing a hair thing, but I <laughs> usually do it maybe once a week. It's not something I like to do. I like to let my hair air dry versus using the heating tools because they can be so damaging. Yes, so again, the, the ends often justify the means, right? People want to get some wave in their hair. People want the hair, if they got very curly hair, they, they want it to be bone straight. And, and so th these are the techniques that get you there. But I think, as you said, people do recognize that there are consequences to this. And um, so, you know, I don't really want to say you should only do it a given period of time or whatever, but, you know, you, I think people are aware that it is damaging and, and the more they can contail that, probably the better the hair is shape is going to be but you know again I, I go back to conditioners can can mask all merit all, all manners of, of evils that we do to our hair and so uh, just make sure you use a good conditioner cool so can you tell us a little bit about your research center there yes um we are a, a non-for-profit research institution located in, in the princeton area and, and we do research on fibrous materials particularly hair um so we, we do, a lot. We, one of the fun things is we work with just about every company in the hair care area in some way, shape or form. So we, we will do contract testing for some people, routine testing. We will collaborate on research projects with other people. We do a lot of education for new people who are joining the field. Um, we organize conferences on the area of hair science and bring together people from you know, people researching on hair from all over the world. So uh, early in June, we, we had a, a conference that um, we had to run online this year be, because of, you know, all the health issues. Uh, but we had over a thousand hair scientists join this meeting. And wow. so, uh, you know, we feel part of our mission is, is to bring together scientists working on this for, for the good of, of the hair care world. So it, it's, you know, it's good for people to be able to share science and share ideas um, rather than keep it all in-house and yes. um, so we had you know representatives from all of the big companies presenting we had representatives from the ingredient suppliers presenting 
uh, and it was just a, a very very enjoyable event so you know this this is we work with you know the, the big consumer giants we work with the small companies who are trying to get on qvc so uh, you know in some way shape or form we, we work with all of these guys and that's what makes it uh, very fun and, and and enjoyable very cool very cool uh, i know we're getting close to the end here do you have anything else pertinent to the topic that you would like to share with the audience um, I think we probably covered most of the things. Um, a lot of highlights, yes. Yes, but uh, you know, again, I please just remember that these products have huge benefits to what they do. You know, the shampoos clean your hair; they're not going to damage your hair. Conditioners can mask all manner of ills; they're not going to damage your hair. Um, but you know, be a bit wary of some of the communication messages out there. And. Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, it is the markets and people's jobs to tell stories that make you buy those products. Some of those stories are very nice, attractive stories. Some people can drift into uh, a bit more of a fuzzy realm. But uh, please, you know, question it. The science behind all of them is pretty much the same, whether it be an expensive product, whether it be a cheap product. If you're prepared to spend that extra money for a nice fragrance you like, knock yourself out. But you know, please don't think it's going to be efficaciously any better. Very well said. Well, I hope that this helps somebody today, to, especially somebody on a budget that thinks that these products, these more expensive products are going to be better when not necessarily true. So uh, thank you, Dr. Evans, for being on my uh, YouTube channel today. I really do appreciate you taking the time. I uh, was happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. And if you guys like this video, please give it a thumbs up and uh, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell to be alerted to when the next video drops. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.